Greetings, and bienvenue, mine crew. Thank you for returning to this broadcast. And welcome to new viewers joining us for the first time. If you like a video, then feel free to subscribe. Some viewers may find the following video disturbing. Viewer discretion is advised. Secluded communities. Hey X, I have a story from few years ago that I recently remembered. And now I'm curious what you think I currently live in Oregon. So that's where this happened. My first job out of high school was at a grocery store in my smallish town, 30,000 people. And I worked as a clerk in the natural food and nutrition section. So I got some weird people coming through every week, but none that have stayed with me years later like this. One night, at around 10, two very tall men approached me and asked for my help finding some vitamins and herbs. Both of them struck me as strange immediately, but I was and still am polite and friendly by nature. So I pushed aside any suspicion and met them with my usual smile. The younger of the two was over six foot five and the older was even taller, but not quite seven feet based on my memory. They were ethnically white, had the same shade of brown hair, early to mid twenties, and were brothers. The thing about them that surprised me the most was that they couldn't read. They had approached me because they needed me to tell them which bottles were what. The older brother was looking specifically for any herbs that would help with ADHD and concentration issues. When I started to explain what some herbs are known for helping, he got very standoffish and almost offended that I would assume he didn't know his herb knowledge. The younger was much more friendly and pretty obviously had a thing for me. I'm a girl. He was curious about my hair color, and when I told him I dyed it black, but it was naturally brown, similar to their own, he acted like that was the stupidest thing I could do. When they left, I mentioned the encounter to a co-worker, and he told me that they were part of a family that lived secluded out in the woods somewhere around town. I may have seen their mother in the store that night too. She had a family resemblance, and I kind of had just a gut feeling that she was like the two men, but I can't be sure. Regular weirdos? X or something more. I live in the South. I haven't had many run-ins with people like that. I work in a grocery store. But I had one woman ask me about coconut water. So I asked her what she needed the coconut water for, and she started talking to me about how she uses it to wash over a necklace she has to ward off voodoo. She went on about these strange superstitions from her home country, things like keeping an open pair of scissors under her bed, and burning some herbs she got from a botanica. Another thing I heard from a co-worker is how in certain counties in my state, the conversation about how to have healthy father-daughter and brother-sister relationships. The Christian talk is something their social worker wife had to have too often while they lived in those really rural counties. This is Hell's Gate. It is located in a secluded community called Turnbull Canyon in Hacienda Heights, California, 25 miles east of Los Angeles. Hell's Gate is actually an abandoned driveway built for a large ranch-style home that burned down in a huge fire in 1989 that destroyed 11 very expensive homes. It is rumored that prior to the fire, the house belonged to former leader of the Church of Satan, Anton LaVey. It has been long rumored as far back as the 70s that satanic worship took place at the home but it was never proven. Fast forward to 2013, the property is supposedly under new ownership according to Zillow. The new owner added barbed wire fences and security cameras to the home's entrance, Hell's Gate Pick related. The actual property has not been repaired since the fire, but the property and landscape are kept up to some extent. The centerpiece to the property is a partially damaged grand fireplace measuring almost 10 feet in length and 18 feet tall. The grounds around the fireplace are kept particularly well. There are two new buildings that were built when the new owners took over, but nobody has been able to get a good look at it because there are guard dogs who watch the property 24-7. Everyone in Hacienda Heights and neighbor city La Habra know about Hell's Gate, but have never witnessed any paranormal or satanic activity personally. This is why most residents, police, neighbors, etc., turns a blind eye to the property but there are many who hope to infiltrate the property and document it, and efforts are still underway to get some hard evidence of this 40-year local legend. Hi folks, this is a story from my grandma. She is still all well alive as well as Gramps. Sometimes she asks me questions about my life and education, and one day just asks, since you are a scientist, do you believe there is something more? 
I'm an actual scientist. I say that I am 100% sure as the universe is vast that there are things I won't be able to explain in my lifetime. So she proceeds to the following story. It was just after World War II. Her uncle or similar kin were going through a village looking for abandoned houses in a group of a few people. This is northern Poland near the town of Morog. In one of the villages, where she and Gramps later settled, just like their next of kin, there were some Germans left, usually widows or people who could not or refused to leave. Locals were treating them in all manner of ways, but this story proceeded as follows. We'll just call the uncle Roman by his name. Roman and guys roam the village, go to the bit more secluded part off the main road. Most houses were empty, the Germans left. In one house, they see a woman, they wave at her. She is in the attic window. She quickly walked away from it, so they went into the house. Cannot see her, Roman proceeds to the attic. The door is shut, but bars easily with help of his bro. They get upstairs, the woman hangs on a rope, hung herself, still convulsing a bit. Try to get her down ASAP, but she dies right in front of them. She was German, likely thought they were Russians. Most Germans can't tell the difference. Was probably afraid of Kami, liberation. The church in the village survived. They took her down and carried her to the church. Explained to the priest, he says they can bury her the next day. Since the house wasn't abandoned, was stocked, Roman and co decide to stay the night. Attic has a bed, the bottom floor has two more beds. Guys light a fire in the yard to warm food since night is good. Roman says he's tired and will take the attic bed. Goes to bed, gets in. Gets into the attic, hears shouting from outside. Roman, Roman, pissed off, gets to the window and asks, let me sleep, morons. Guys say they are silent. To hell is his problem. Shrugs and complains about the bros and goes back to bed. Hears Roman again, but silent, gets pushed down on the bed as if someone sat on him, cannot breathe. Roman sees nothing, cannot move, gets pushed so far down the bed, starts to squeak and crack. All four stops in a second. Roman jumps out of bed, runs to the window. Guy's still there, runs downstairs, asks the guys if they heard his name being called. All Pikachu face, decides to sleep downstairs. Bro sleeping upstairs afterwards, no issue. The next day, bury the woman, go back to the house. No further activity. The house was abandoned a few years later as the village shrunk and people left for a better location in the village. They never complained and even said it's a pity they had to leave a large house. Be me. 2020. Plague lockdown. Did not give a damn and went to my friend's house. Sort of a mini reunion. Friend ask if we can go fishing in their boat again just like old times. Our town has a bay area accessible by the river. We used to do this with our friends and their parents to go fishing near the bay and have some fun during our teens. Our friends decided to do that again. Other friends are experienced fishermen. They grew up poor in the town and were taught fishing by their parents to make a living. Me and my other one friend are the only ones that didn't really know how to. Set up their boats, go near the bay, kind of happy with the mini reunion. Didn't catch much, but we got our fair share to go home with and cook while in the lockdown. Suddenly noticed something big surfacing in the horizon, like more than a thousand meters in. Thought it's gonna be my first cryptid moment. It isn't a cryptid, it's a whole submarine. Friends started to notice too and were mesmerized by it. I thought to myself, that ain't right. We don't even have a sub in my country. Whose sub is this? After a few minutes, I noticed it submerging again into the water. Gone in a matter of minutes. Stayed there for an hour talking about what we saw and hoping it resurfaces again. Never resurfaces again. Went back home and cooked our catch. I kept searching if there's any joint operation exercises or anything related in the Navy in my country. None. The bay area is really big but secluded like you have to enter an entrance to enter the bay. Realize our country's Navy isn't that capable enough, but it sure as hell can detect submarines within the vicinity. Bay Area is big, and the country's capital is literally beside it on the other side. It's been three years, but I'm still wondering what was that sub doing deep in our country's territory. Be me. Five or six years ago. Start lurking in X because I had a passing interest in orbs, and a thread was one of the first results on Google. Always believed to some degree that the world had a covert paranormal nature, and it was not just what people accept it is. The stories people say here range from the plausible to the absolutely ridiculous. I'm hooked. Three or four months pass by, lurking on X daily, 
reading through anything I see and searching for relevant sources to stuff I find interest in. Sometimes I catch glimpses of shadows in the corner of my eyes. When it is nighttime, it is like something dark is moving, but always out of reach of my eyes. Haha, <laughs> I must be really sleepy. After some time, when I get on the bed to sleep, I can feel that something is there in the room with me. Too afraid to actually open my eyes to check. If I ever find the courage to do so, don't see anything, but still feel that something is close to me. I am beyond shit my pants scared with the whole situation. Happens more and more often. It's Christmas holidays. Go to my parents' home, because uni is closed for the period and I wanted to see friends from my hometown. I share a room with my brother, and I didn't have any problems at all before sleeping. Maybe I was just being crazy. Go out with friends, but friend A had some work to do so couldn't come. The holidays were close to ending. We haven't met in a long time, so A invites me to his home so that we can talk freely and catch up. A lives on the more secluded parts of the town, high up on a hill. I may say town, but it is actually more of a big village. We have lots of nature around and you can go anywhere you want on foot. Meet with A. He made some honeyed wine, because why not? I tell him some of the things I read here while we talk. He also had an interest in the occult, so we talk for a long time. At this point, I haven't said a word of what has been happening at night while living alone, because I thought people will probably just dismiss it as paranoia. It is nighttime, and I also didn't want to overstay my welcome, so I left. As I walk the road that goes down the hill on foot, I can feel something is following me. I can feel it approaching bit by bit, so move a little bit faster while also looking behind me every now and then to check if there is actually something there. Don't see anything, but I am not going to risk it. I don't want to sound crazy, but I know I will so screw it. You can choose on your own whether to believe me or not. Feel a hand reaching out to me from the back, grabbing me by the shoulder and turning me around. See absolutely nothing. That hand, or whatever you want to call it, felt like the most cold and uncomfortable thing I ever felt. I am stuck frozen there for close to one minute. Felt like an hour, though. I just walked towards home, completely broken. I didn't feel no fear, no cold, nothing at all. I was just completely broken. It is time to go back to uni, so my parents take me to the station. As I leave home, I drop a charm that was given to me by my grandma. It's pick-related. Only find out about it after I boarded the bus. Be sad because I really love my grandma, and I really appreciated the charm. Always took it with me when I was going out. After going to uni again, I didn't see any shadows and didn't feel anything in my room before sleeping. It was like nothing ever happened. Spring break comes. Go back to parents' home. Find the charm on the pavement outside the main gate of the house. MFW, nobody saw it or picked it up from the ground for so long, even though my house is in a central spot and many people pass by daily. A few summers ago, some friends and I decided to do some spelunking in abandoned places around local cities. There's this old campus from the 50s or 60s that is just rotting in the middle of a small city near us. It's near the edge of town, and the only way to access it are these little gaps and fences. It's sort of surrounded by small patches of forest, so it's pretty secluded. It was pretty standard abandoned building stuff if you've ever done that sort of thing. Several buildings ranging from walkable to completely destroyed. Lots of trash, graffiti, drugs, and alcohol remains. We didn't see anyone else there, but it was obvious that people go there fairly often. Cops do patrol the area occasionally to keep out any drifters or people that shack up there, apparently. Only one of my friends had been there before, and he actually noticed something. One building had a huge gate around it with barbed wire fencing. It wasn't worth getting past the gate, and he had never gone into that particular building before. However, a tree had fallen over and knocked the gate down, so we got to go in. As we explored the completely dark building, it was in much better condition than the others, and we had been only some of the lucky few to be allowed in. The building was different. There were massively secure doors, and eventually we concluded that each of the rooms were actually small cells where they kept people. I thought this was a school, we all chirped. It was creepy. We got to the top floor and there was a big open room, auditorium type. Sounds echoed crazy in there. The only graffiti on the wall was just children died here. That one building was a juvenile detention center located on the campus for bad kids. It was eerie to come across it like that. All my life I had lived in small secluded towns in northern Canada. For about eight years we lived in a town that was hours from any major place. At the time, this town was hardly on any map. 
Within the town, I went to the only high school around, which was a 45-minute drive from my house. There was also another family and their 12 children that attended that school. It didn't take me long to notice that there was something off about these kids. There was one in my grade. He was pretty cool and seemingly normal most of the time. We became pretty good friends. However, in the grades below, the other kids seemed to look more messed up. There were two in the 11th grade that looked pretty normal. One was a guy named Kyle, the other a girl named Brittany. Although they looked normal, the way they acted was off. They were always so close to each other. I've even seen them sitting on each other's laps. I was a little weirded out, but I never said anything. In the lower grades, there were four others spread out between grades 10 and 9. Two sets of twins. These kids, however, looked different. They all looked the same, but the younger two had more deformities. One had something wrong with their hand, the other's eyes looked more sunken in. There were four other, much younger children in the family that were downright scary and hard to look at. Every one of the kids had the same features. Black hair, sky blue, insanely light eyes, pale skin, and their voices were disturbingly similar. I spent a few years hanging out with the older one. As I said, he was completely normal. I remember we would always hang out at my place, though. He would be quick to protest anything involving people going to his house, as if he was scared of having us there or something. A lot of people would talk about that family. Specific things I would hear were about the younger kids and how the parents were strange people. I never met any of them in person, but I've seen pictures. The parents had the same look, but they also looked like they hadn't eaten or been outside in years. They looked sickly pale and scary skinny. Many times child services were called to their house. I don't really know what went down there, but those younger kids were so messed up. One was always sick, and his general face structure was off. His eyes were extremely sunken in. His skin had a grey tint to it. His hair was stringy and patches were missing a lot. The other, also a boy, had the same facial deformities, but it was accompanied with mental problems. He was so violent. In 1992, I finally moved out of that town and lost touch with my friend. In 1998, I heard through another friend from the same place that the family is confirmed for committing Chris Chan. The two youngest that I knew were the children of the two siblings I knew in 11th grade. After that, they had more kids that came out even more screwed up. My friend moved far, far away at the age of 20, right after graduation, and was never heard from again. I grew up in a tiny town sub 1,000 people, secluded, very rural. There was a two-lane road leading out and most everything else was gravel. Got a lot of stories from there. One that I remember the clearest is walking along the riverbank deep in the woods behind the falls. I was there with a couple of friends. I remember it because it was summer. I remember it was summer because of the whine of the June bugs and the red and black beetles who'd land on us every now and then and freak my friend out. Anyway, we're walking along this overgrown trail when we see a bag with something sticking out of it. Chris, that's the one who doesn't like bugs, doesn't want anything to do with it, Matt does. I'm the deciding vote and I'm like, hell yeah. So we go over and see what's in the bag. Bones. No big deal. It's a rural town. People abandon their pets in messed up ways, or maybe it died or whatever. We press on. Further down the overgrown trail, on the lookout for sumac and poison oak, dead pine needles crunching underfoot, there's another bag, this time hanging from a tree. Again, bones, these ones a little less identifiable. Chris wants to go home now. I tell him to shut up. We're not far from where a good place to swim is. At least I think it makes sense the further away from the falls you go, the better the swimming holes, right? We walk in silence for a good 10 minutes or so, and we come across this shack, wood all gray and gnarled from the weather, leaning to one side, and it smells just awful. Matt wants to check it out. I want to check it out. Even Chris wants to check it out. So we start crunching our way towards it when we start hearing these sickening whomps coming from the inside of it. By the time I say maybe we should leave, Chris is already halfway home. I will never forget the way it smelled, sweet, cloying, but also like the worst rot ever. I live in the Midlands, one of the areas of England that's been densely populated for millennia. Some areas are very secluded. There's old blood families and older traditions that far predate both Christianity and the Roman cultural invasion. So there's this town, and by town I mean like one main road and like a private school, a manor and three or four cul-de-sacs off shooting from the main road that winds through the woodlands alongside the motorway heading south. 
It's a quick time saver that cuts like 15 minutes off, following the motorway to the huge multi-level island that allows me to get onto an intersecting eastbound motorway to get off at my own town. Instead, I head through this place which leads onto some back roads with an abandoned mental institution and an airfield and through an old army barracks, now a supply depot for truckers, and I'm home. Small, out-of-the-way place, right? Well, it always seemed a little odd. Weird tree trunks carved into the shape of animals like a stag, an owl or a huge snake always caught my eye, but more besides. You never saw people, ever. You would drive past the school at lunchtime and see no children on the playground, no sound of rambunctious kids. But everything was clean and maintained. The town was as clearly inhabited as any other, but you never saw people. Once during an insane flooding period about five years ago, all the buses were out of service and I had to walk from college along the motorway in a t-shirt and jeans in a torrential downpour, and by the time I reached the town, I was passed by a bus, so clearly about an hour later, with my feet sore and soggy. The buses were back on, so I wait at the town bus stop. I wait for an hour. Three buses passed me. Not one stopped. I never saw another person in the town. So that's all just set up. I'll make another post for my story. So as we established this town, well, a village, I suppose, was strange, yes? So here's the story. Late autumn time back in 2008, I think. Me and some at the time first-year college buddies are doing what most English lads do at the time, which is get in their shitty boy racers' cars and go cruising around the countryside and maybe end the evening in the city, hit the pubs and bars, grab some pizza or a kebab, head home by one and call it good. So we do our thing. We head to my college town for some particularly amazing Indian food and head back to my place for some beers and rock band. Naturally, we want to take my usual shortcut. This time, however, it was different. Bear in mind, we aren't dude bros. We never drink and drive. I rarely drink at all, in fact. So we were all completely sober. I was in the passenger seat, my buddy driving and my brother and his GF in the back. We head through the village and something's up. There's lit lanterns everywhere. We slow down figuring it's some Halloween thing but it's not even October yet, so it's too early. I think it was closer to when our primary school teachers would tell us about the tradition of harvest festivals, but I'm 26, so primary school was a long time ago at this point. Anyway, we slow down and cruise at a slower than walking pace with our interest peaked. It's not just lanterns, but decorations, including what I can only describe as scarecrows or stuffy guys, ready to sit atop a bonfire. Some were sitting in chairs on porches, Others stood up around town like people, and a noise, like drums beating. So we were thoroughly creeped out, but still slowly moving, being the cliché horror movie dumb teens enthralled by the utter strangeness. There was an ad tang to the air, like burning rubber, oranges and semen, a strange melange of scents I've never forgotten. We could tell from the glare as we rounded the first corner. We could see an orange glow from a large fire on the huge open area alongside the half-mile track leading from the paved road to the secluded manor house. We couldn't see because of the typical English hedgerows, but we could hear a loud commotion. Clearly people, but also some strange sounds like, if you have ever heard a pig scream, and I don't mean squeal, anyone who's heard it knows a pig can scream and it's almost human-like, but not quite. So we start to speed up a little. We roll the windows up, this ain't no movie or creepypasta. This was real life, and yeah, he'll admit we were pretty spooked. Still, we go slow enough to eye all the weird shit around. The wooden trunks carved into animals have what I can only describe as offerings before them. One, a bushel of grains, another offal, another cakes or something and so on. Bear in mind this is 11pm in autumn. The sky is pitch black here, no stars from cloud cover, and everything is lit by the flickering orange glow of the old school fire and oil-looking lanterns hanging from poles and tree branches everywhere. Then we get to the green, such as it was in this little village. Behind it was the pub, the bus stop I mentioned before, and a small grass patch surrounded by a chain-link fence in between. On the grass there was a dead cow on its back, split open down the middle. This was the point I felt genuine fear in a my-life-could-end-tonight sort of way, because cut into the cow was a bunch of guys in what I can only describe as shitty wizard outfits. Red robes with sun, moon and stars on them like a little kid wanting to be Albus Dumbledore. They had knives and were cutting into this thing like there was treasure inside if only they could cut deep enough. The driver stopped. They stopped and looked at us. We looked at them. A couple of seconds passed but it felt like a good five or six minutes. Then they bellowed and ran to the car. 
So all of a sudden, we are the unlucky Spanish cops in Resident Evil 4, and the Ganados are out for us. A brick bounces off the windshield with a crack leaving a fracture that was very expensive to repair for my bro's student income. They are yelling, stop em, get em, and road should have been closed, and a bunch of shit I can't make out. Needless to say, we are all screaming, drive, and we do. One guy hits the back just as we are accelerating and looking back, I see the weapon he was cutting into the cow with was a straight, ornate looking knife of a very dark metal. The rest becomes a blur as we speed down the back roads at almost triple the legal speed limit and get home. Here's the kicker. Car is damaged, clearly. Took a brick to the windscreen after all, so we call the police. Two mid-forties coppers arrive three hours later good old expeditious UK countryside police time, and ask us what happened. We explain. They look at each other with a look that clearly says, if these kids were behind the wheel, we would breathalyzer them and get a positive at first. Then they ask where we were. We tell them. This time they share a different look, the kind of look you see two kids share when they are asked by their parents if they know if their friend did something bad, and indeed they do. They mention to look into it, but it sounds like drunks. Just be careful at night, lads and leave. We never heard anything of it. Thing of ye. Epilogue. My now deceased granddad, who used to run the biggest accident recovery firm in the area, and naturally was the place the cops came for on the job, cups of tea and biscuits and a gossip had mentioned the town more than once apparently. For one period in the year, bad stuff happens there, and it's just ignored. Some pull from the Manorborn folk, who own most of the area apparently. My granddad told me about one time he was called there at the time for an abandoned car and found a young girl cut to pieces under the bridge leading out of town. He got very pale, his hands shook, and with a bitter laugh mentioned how the cops that came to the call out were both from the town and with a look of disgust mentioned one of them lifting up one of the girl's removed breasts and said, Hey Derek, want to cop a handful of tit? Like it was nothing. It was reported in the media as an accident, one of many. It's a bad road that time of year, people say. People get cut off in floods or snow and just end up meeting a bad end, people say. They accept it, they don't question it. All I know is I haven't been down that road in half a decade and don't plan to go there anytime soon. A lot of talk for an unfortunately low payoff story that I'm sure sounds like generic bullshit. That's life, I suppose. Even when people are crazy, it's still just a story, one that plays out the world over. I just know he'll never forget that night. Never stop wondering what was going on, and what if we didn't drive off in time, then I just thank God that we did. I can tell you about the time I slept in a field and heard bizarre chanting in the early midnight. Just a hundred or so meters from my spot inside a small duvet in my clearing, I heard bizarre speaking and sounds. I wasn't carrying back then like I am now, so I was pretty freaked out. Not being noticed though, I found my balls and slowly went closer to the sounds. Farm field is usually separated by thin tree lines varying in width of density to the next field, creeping up the hillside into the tree line of the next field. I could make out three people, likely all men, hacking and smashing some kind of corpse in the distance. Think rural south, all with its ticks, mosquitoes, fireflies, and chirping from the crickets. The intensity of these sounds was nowhere around, not one peep from wildlife or the insects that usually inhabit a night in the south. Scared, and just a few dozen meters from the men as I sit hidden in the tree line. I can barely make out the shape of what they are hooting and hollering around. It's a dead cow. Now fearful for my life, I turn around and make haste to grab my backpack and book it out of there. I, to my disbelief, cartoonishly stepped on a stick and it snapped. I looked instantly back in fear and saw three whack jobs staring in my direction, and then they started yelling to me, as if they knew I was there and I just booked it. I darted and they started screaming behind me. I snatched up my book bag, left my sleeping bag on the ground still unraveled, and leapt through the fields. All the while my heart was pounding out of my chest. They're still screeching behind, probably about half a football field, saying they're gonna gut me and cut my head off. I leap through a few more tree lines, jump over a fence post into another field, and finally make it to the long unlit road beside the properties. I trip and fall over in a roll down into a small ditch next to my side of the road, get up and then scrabble across the asphalt. By the time I get over the other fence on the opposite side of the road, which was a much flatter plane and easier to maneuver, climbing over the barbed wire, sticking my shoes into the metal spokes. 
The hollering had stopped, and I turned around to see if they were following me. I was almost paralyzed by my anxiousness. I didn't know if they were still there, and the field next to me was open moonlight, so for sure if they were now next to the road, they would be able to see me. Hidden by the black shadow of the common tree line, I just waited. And I waited. And I waited for what seemed to be ages, and I felt a bit more calm as each minute went by. Eventually, I felt like I could move from there, but I didn't. I was still scared and just wanted morning to come already, a long ways off. Then something moved. Someone moved across from the road on the side I had just come from. Literally, someone had stood there for what seemed like an eternity, and they walked off. Back the way they chased me. I felt like I was going to be stabbed in the back any second. So I just waited and prayed that he didn't see me. I stayed there until early morning sunrise when the light became red and orange and I could see clearer over to the tree line I had come from, across the road. Yet I stayed still in that spot, finally lying down until the first cars started to pass by the spot, eventually heading towards the town I had previously attempted to get to before nightfall the night I had just lived through. The moral of this story is that you need to fucking carry. Don't be a stupid kid who thinks he's invincible. I don't know if they would have actually killed me. Maybe they were trying to scare me, but I feel as though no non-murderer would stay in a spot secluded in the darkness waiting to see me unless they were fucked in the head. I'm not good at green text either, nor am I special at telling experiences and stories. You get what you get, but it is the truth. I hope that you enjoyed tonight's broadcast. If you enjoyed tonight's story, then please subscribe to the channel as more green texts will appear daily. A new broadcast will appear when the clock strikes. Midnight Central Time. Remember to check out the Odyssey page in the description for a second archive of the channel's videos. There's also a Rumble archive as a backup.